I'm honored to introduce Tygen Dan Layton. Tygen is a Dharma successor of Tenshin Reb Anderson, and he's an authorized teacher in the Japanese Soto School. Tygen is now guiding Dharma teacher of the ancient Dragon Zen Gate Sangha based in Chicago. He has taught at many universities. He's currently teaching online at the Institute of Buddhist Studies of the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, from where he has a PhD. He has also published articles in many books and journals. He's the author of 10 books, including Faces of Compassion, Visions of Awakening, Space and Time, and Just This Is It. He's also the co-translator and editor of Dogen's extensive record and cultivating the empty field, among others. Today's Dharma talk is titled Soto Zen Meditation Tradition. Taigan, we welcome you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me in the room as well? Yes. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be back in Atlanta. Uh, I want to talk today about the Soto Zen meditation tradition and its uh, continuity. Uh, I will want to talk about uh, Chateau, uh, Yaoshan, uh, if we have time, Dongshan, Hongzhe, and Dogen, and, and their meditation practice and teaching. Uh, Tayun, when we first spoke of um, my giving a talk again here, uh, asked me to say something about my practice history. So I will, to, uh, as an introduction, I uh, had the opportunity to spend three months going around Kyoto and Nara in 1970, looking at the Buddha images and rock gardens and so forth. Um, Four years later, in January 75, I had my first Zazen instruction with uh, Nakajima Sensei, who trained at Sojiji, Soto Zen priest. And he spoke about, when he spoke, gave Zazen instruction, which instantly uh, felt like it was right for me. He also spoke about Dogen. So I, my uh, studies and writing career has all been about looking at Dogen and where he, his teaching came from. I moved from New York to San Francisco and San Francisco Zen Center in mid-1978, uh, practiced three years at Tassajara, had transmission for Red Rendition in 2000. In 2007, relocated to Chicago, Ancient Dragon Zen Gate. So uh, I'm going to start. Uh, so I'm giving these uh, excerpts from Dogen's extensive record, which I'll talk about more later. But I wanted to start with Shito, or may, I don't know if he used the Chinese or Japanese, Sekito in Japanese. Um, and he's the author of the Sando Kai and so on, the Harmony of Difference and Sameness in the Song of the Grass Hut. But there's a little story about him that Dogen cites, which I, I think is very much to the point. Uh, one of his students asked Shito, what is the essential meaning of Buddha Dharma? So this is the basic question, right? Um, sometimes it's phrased as why, why did Bodhidharma come from the West? <clears throat> anyway, um, Shito just said not to attain, not to know. So this non-attainment and, and not knowing is key to all of Sota Zen. This a student who was persistent said, beyond that, is there any other pivotal point or not? And Shito said, the wide sky does not obstruct the white clouds drifting. The wide sky does not obstruct the white clouds drifting and vice versa, of course. So this is a wonderful meditation instruction. Um, thoughts and feelings drift by in our stream of consciousness. And then they don't obstruct the great open sky. So this is the basic teaching of Zazen, not to try and get rid of these thoughts and feelings, but not to be caught up by them either. 
uh, Dogen said about this, not attaining, not knowing is Buddha's essential meaning. The wind blows into the depths and further winds blow, uh, which might be taken as a reference to a phrase Dogen uses often, Buddha going beyond Buddha. When Shakyamuni was awakened, he didn't stop practicing and he didn't stop awakening. Dogen continues, the wide sky does not obstruct the white clouds drifting. At such a time, why do you take the trouble to ask Shito? So that's the first excerpt I want to give. And Shito was, uh, his life was 700 to 790. So this goes back to the 8th century uh, in China. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, one of Shito's successors, Yaoshan or Yakusan in Japanese. Once a monk asked Yaoshan, what are you thinking whilst in set, steadfast, immovable sitting like this? Yaoshan said, I think of nothing. <laughs> the monk asked, how do you think not thinking? <laughs> and Yaoshan said, well, he said it in, in Sino-Japanese, it's hishiryo. And this is kind of uh, the, the traditional con translation of hishiryo is non-thinking. I don't know which one you use in your, uh, there, I don't know if you, do you chant the Fukan Zazengi there? If so, it's also, the story is also there in Dogen's basic instructions for Zazen. And it's often translated as non-thinking. Uh, I translate it as beyond thinking, and that's because of Shohaku Okamura, who I believe you're connected with, to it with. Uh, I heard Shohaku talking about this, uh, I think at San Francisco Zen Center, and he said beyond thinking. So non-thinking didn't never meant anything to me. I mean, what's the difference between not thinking and non-thinking in Zazen? Uh, so a lot of people still prefer non-thinking. It's maybe an aesthetic preference. But when I heard Shohaku say beyond thinking, I decided to, to go to Japan for two years to, to translate Dogen with him just because of that one word. So beyond thinking, um, which is what Yaoshan said, um, includes not thinking. It includes thinking. It's a kind of awareness that is deeper than thinking or not thinking. It's this awareness that we taste in Zazen, in upright sitting, silent upright sitting. So uh, I like beyond thinking. <laughs> That's my preference. So I, I spent two years in Kyoto translating with Shohaku because of that one word. Uh, Let the, me just a moment, if we will, tell again. Excuse we, me? We emphasize the non-thinking here as okay. being somewhere between thinking and not thinking and non-doing in the same sense and non-being in the same sense. So um, that's uh, kind of our emphasis here. And I, I also think of this as, as beyond thinking, but also before thinking, the state of mind before, before thought arises. Thank you. Thank you, Tayo. And I would say it includes all of that. <laughs> um, but anyway, as I said, it's an aesthetic preference. I like beyond thinking. and. Shohaku translated it that way, and, and uh, so I started uh, doing translations with him because of that. <clears throat> Dokken says about this, the existing mind is already withered. Non-mind has not yet appeared. In the vitality of this lifetime, purity is supreme. So that was Dokken's comment on that, that story. Um, so I want to leave time for discussion, but uh, I'll mention Dongshan, who was considered, who was two generations after Yaoshan. He's considered the founder of Soto in China, or Dong as it's called in Chinese. And um, you probably have all heard this story, but when uh, Dongshan was ready to leave his teacher, Yunyan, who was a disciple of Yaoshan, um, Dongshan went to him, he was gonna go off traveling and meeting with other teachers. And uh, Dongshan asked Yunyan um, later on, uh, if I 
am asked to describe your reality, your dharma, your teaching. How should I respond? So Yun Yun paused. And then he said, just this is it. And the, the story goes that Dongshan was lost in thought. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Can you all hear me okay? You're fine here. Okay, good. I'll continue. So uh, Dongshan was lost in thought. He didn't say anything and he left. And as he was as he was proceeding on his journey, he crossed a stream. He looked down and saw his reflection in the stream. And then he, he composed the following verse. Just don't seek from others or you'll be far estranged from self. Now I go on alone. Everywhere I meet it. It now is me. I now am not it. One must understand in this way to merge with suchness. So this, just this line, it now is me. I now am not it. If you don't remember anything else of Soto Zen, that's enough. It now is me. I now am not it. Um, I could say a lot more about that, but um, this is kind of like um, Genjo Koan, where Dogen says, uh, when myriad things, when you when you carry yourself forward and project yourself on the myriad things, that's delusion. When the myriad things arise and experience themselves, of course, including each of us, that's awakening. So this, I now am not it, it but it now is me, is um, also a Zazen instruction. You can think of this, say this, as you face the wall. I now am not it. It now is me. Of course, that wall is the whole universe. So I'm just giving some excerpts from our Soto, Chinese Soto tradition, uh, which I believe show this continuous thread, this bloodline of Zazen and how that is for our tradition. Uh, I talk about Dongshan and much more in my book, Just This Is It, Dongshan and Practice of Suchness. So forgive me for promoting some of my books. But anyway, um, uh, this, this approach to Zazen, it now is me, I now am not it, or the wide sky does not obstruct the bright clouds drifting by, or um, how do you think of not thinking, non-thinking or beyond thinking, whichever you prefer. Um, it has continued, I believe, through the Soto tradition. This is the heart of our Zazen practice, our Soto practice. So I want to give one or two, uh, I'll be mindful of the time, one or two excerpts from uh, Hongzhi, who was later on, uh, so Dongshan was in the uh, ninth century, Hongzhi is in the 10 hundreds, in the 11th century, and is an important source for Dogen later in the 12th hundreds in Japan. Um, so this is from a book I did, Cultivating the Empty Field, and maybe I'll just say when uh, before I read some excerpts that this is based on my master's thesis, uh, where I, and I attended um, San Francisco, uh, the, uh, California Institute of Integral Studies after I returned to San Francisco from Tassajara, mainly because uh, Tom Cleary was teaching there, and I wanted to study with him, and so I had that great. Um, pleasure and privilege of studying with Tom, Thomas Cleary for a year. Um, but I also, he, he left after a year because he uh, went into re reclusion for the rest of his life. But um, this was, this cultivating the empty field, 
is based on my master's thesis. And it has various little practice instructions or Dharma words from Hongzhe, who again was the greatest Saodong or Soto teacher in China in the century before Dogen. Uh, uh, as I, when I first translated it all, uh, I went to my thesis advisor, a very fine Tibetan Buddhist scholar named Mark Tatz, and showed and gave it to him to look at. And then I came back and he said to me, this is no good, start over. <laughs> and I thought I'd done the translation, um, but he said, you've translated the words, but not the meaning. So this book came about because I then had to, well, wanted to um, uh, sit zazen with each of these teachings, each of these practice instructions. So that's where this book comes from. So I'm gonna read a couple of those if I have time. Yeah, sure. Um, this one I called, and, and these the names of these, for any of you have you've seen the book with, were things I pulled out of the, of the teaching, but this is a little longer. Hongshu said, the practice of true reality is simply to sit serenely in silent introspection. When you have fathomed this, you cannot be turned around by external causes and conditions. This empty, wide open mind is subtly and serenely, correctly illuminating. Spacious and content without confusion from inner thoughts of grasping, effectively overcome habitual behavior and realize the self that is not possessed by emotions. He must be broad-minded, whole without relying on others. Such upright, independent spirit can begin not to pursue degrading situations. Here, in what we call Zazen, you can rest and become clean, pure, and lucid. Bright and penetrating, you can immediately return accord and respond to deal with events. So this is very much Dogen's emphasis that our Zazen is not about uh, attaining something or realizing and understanding something. It's about responding, how we respond in our everyday activity. And it's here in Hongzhe too. It goes on, everything is unhindered. Clouds gracefully floating up to the peaks. The moonlight glitteringly flowing down mountain streams. The entire place is brightly illuminated and spiritually transformed totally unobstructed and clearly manifesting responsive interaction like box and lid fitting or arrow points meeting. Continuing, cultivate and nourish yourself to enact maturity and achieve stability. If you accord everywhere with thorough clarity and cut off sharp corners without dependence on doctrines like the white bull or wild cat, helping to arouse wonder, you can be called a complete person. So we hear that this is how one on the way of non-mind acts, but before realizing non-mind, we still have great hardship. So this is one of Hongzhe's practice instructions and it continues the this teaching from Shuto and Yaoshan and Dongshan. Uh, sometimes uh, Hongzhe's um, Meditation style is called serene illumination or silent illumination. Uh, but in, in Soto Zen in Japan, it's just called just sitting. I don't think they're essentially, those are essentially different. Although scholars can get into <laughs> trying to, to parse differences. Um, I'll read one more. Um, and this is fairly dense and includes various other references to uh, meditation teachings, but uh, Hongzhe says, in daytime, the sun, at night, the moon, each in turn does not blind the other. This is how Zen practitioners steadily practice naturally without edges or seams. 
To gain such steadiness, you must completely withdraw from the invisible pounding and weaving of your ingrained ideas. If you want to be rid of this invisible turmoil, you must sit through it and let go of everything. So Dogen later says, drop body and mind, same thing. Attain fulfillment and illuminate thoroughly. Light and shadow altogether forgotten. Drop off your own skin. And Dogen later says, drop body and mind. Shinjin Datsu Rock in Japanese. And the sense dust will be fully purified. The eye readily discerning the brightness. Accept your function, which is to say, settle into your Dharma position, as uh, Dogen puts it. Accept your function and be wholly satisfied. In the entire place, you are not restricted. The whole time, you still mutually respond. So this mutual response is important. It applies to teacher and student, to Zanga, to how we respond to the world. Right in light, there is darkness. Right in darkness, there is light. A solitary boat carries the moonlight at night. It lodges amid the reed flowers, gently swaying in total brilliance. So Hongzhi is wonderful at uh, bringing in nature imagery to express uh, his Zazen teaching. So that's Hongzhi. And I will now add a, um, a little bit from Dogen. So I'll just like three of his Dharma Hall discourses from Ehe Koroku. Dogen's extensive record, which is which I translated with Shohaku. Um, so probably those of you who know Dogen know um, Shobo Genzo, one of his masterworks, True Dharma Eye Treasury. So I want to say a little bit about a Hikoroku, which is Dogen's extensive record, another masterwork of Dogen. Um, the, the essays in Shobo Genzo are a different style of teaching. And almost all of them are from oh, 1243 to 1247, roughly. So Dogen had 10 years of teaching at his temple out in the suburbs of Kyoto, and then moved his, prompt, very quickly moved his whole assembly in 1243 uh, up to the northern mountains of Japan. Uh, uh, Echizen, now called Fukui, and established a Heiji temple, still one of the two um, headquarter temples of Soto Zen. Um, so uh, the, the, I want to read three of uh, Dogen's Dharma Hall discourses, or Jodo in Japanese, Sino Japanese. Uh, this is a different style of teaching. Dogen was standing up on the, or sitting up on the altar on his Dharma seat. The monks were standing in the Dharma hall. And um, this is a style of teaching that um, was common in Chinese Zhaodong or Soto Zen or Chinese Chan generally. So uh, these, these uh, talks are more formal, they're shorter most of them, almost all of them, than the, than the essays in Shobo Genzo, which kind of elaborate on particular themes or koans or particular teachers imagery. Uh, these Dharma Hall discourses from Ehe Koroku are um, more formal, but actually, ironically, they really provide more of a sense of Dogen as a person, and they show his humor. So uh, some... Dogen scholars say that he's that he, after Shobo Genzo, he <laughs> stopped teaching, and far from that, he he continued. And the Ehe Koroku, his extensive record, is how we know about Dogen's mature teaching at 
a Heiji, although there are parts of the this, it's, it's also a massive work like Shobogenzo, and there are parts of it that are from uh, early in his teach, early before his teaching even, if, if from when he was a, a monk studying in China. So it covers a, a, a long period of his life, but it, it's what we have, what we have of his mature teaching in Heiji. So uh, I'm going to read a few, three of these. And they relate, they relate to Zaza. This is from 1251, the next to the last year of Dogen's teaching. He says, what is called Zazen is to sit, cutting through the smoke and clouds without seeking merit. Just become unified, never reaching the end. In dropping off body and mind, what are the body and limbs? How can it be transmitted from within the bones and marrow? Already such, how can we penetrate it? So this is an important part of this, this whole uh, stream of Tsao or Soto Zazen teaching, meditation teaching, already such. So it's not about acquiring, it's not about attaining something as Shuto said way back in the 700s. Uh, it's uh, already such, how can we penetrate it? So it's not, so from, I felt this when the first time I had Zazen instruction, I felt uh, what I would call a wholeness, a sense of wholeness, that everything was okay, just as it is. Uh, it's all right there in that first, even in the first impulse towards practice. But of course, years of practice help to unfold and develop uh, this awareness. Already such, how can we penetrate it, Dogen says. And then he adds, snatching Gautama's hands and legs, one punch knocks over empty space. <laughs> so this is Dogen at his, <laughs> in his way of talking, which goes back in some ways to things like the Blue Cliff Record. Snatching Gotama's hands and legs, one punch knocks over empty space. Karmic consciousness is boundless, without roots. The grasses shoot up and bring forth the wind of the Buddha way. So the Buddha wind is a, an image for the style of teaching of Buddha or the tradition of teaching of Buddha or particular um, lineages. So, uh, this was in 1251. Uh, another Dharma Hall discourse or Jodo, these short teachings, but also from 1251. Again said, the family style of all Buddhas and ancestors is to first arouse the vow to save all living beings by removing suffering and providing joy. So the Bodhisattva vow I imagine you chant it there too, the four bodhisattva vows. This is the beginning of practice, he says. The family style of all Buddhas and ancestors, again, is first to arouse the vow to save all living beings, removing suffering and providing joy. And Dogen continues, only this family style is inexhaustibly bright and clear. In the lofty mountains, we see the moon for a long time. As clouds clear, we first recognize the sky. Cast loose down the precipice, the moonlight shares itself within the 10,000 forms. Even when climbing up the bird's path, taking good care of yourself is spiritual power. So there's a lot here. Uh, he says, um, only this family style is inexhaustibly bright and clear. In the lofty mountains, we see the moon for a long time. So this was literally true for Dogen um, up in the mountains of Eheji. And I experienced this up in the mountains at Tassahara. But I think this also refers to Sashin or, you know, I, I um, my Chicago based Sangha is a non residential lay Sangha. I, I think that's probably your situation in Atlanta too. We sit and then we go back out into the city, into the world and express that. 
So, and you know, if we do this for a while, um, clouds clear and we first recognize the sky, the openness, spaciousness of awakening. And then Dogen continues, cast loose down the precipice, the moonlight shares itself within the 10,000 forms. So the moonlight um, reflected in the streams as they flow down the mountains. So this is about how we return from Zazen to our everyday activities, everyday awareness. Uh, everyday mind is the way, as Nanshuan told, Nansen told Zhaozhou or Joshu, uh, a famous story. The moonlight shares itself within the 10,000 forms. So this, it, even if we realize from the beginning, this wholeness or spaciousness or whatever you want to call it, this ultimate awareness that Zazen can provide us, with, can give us a, a glimmer of at least, uh, then how do we share it? How do we express it? And then uh, Dogen closes this Dharma Hall discourse saying, even when climbing the, up the bird's path, taking good care of yourself is spiritual power. So the bird's path is an image from back to Dongshan in the 800s, the founder of Chinese Tao Dong or Soto. And um, it actually, th this image of the bird's path goes back to the Prajnaparamita Sutras. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because we don't always know. We don't, again, not, not attaining, not knowing. We don't know our path. We don't know the future. We may fear the future. And, you know, in the world, in the troubled world today, there's plenty to fear about the future. But we don't know. It's like the bird's path. We see birds flying in the sky and we can't see their path. Maybe birds can see their path. They migrate thousands of miles through this, uh, back to the same place every uh, fall and spring. So, um, yeah, this image of the bird's path is uh, also useful as a way of seeing zazen. We are on the bird's path. I'm going to read one more um, of these Jodo or Dharma Hall discourses from Dogen, from Dogen's extensive record. This is from a couple of years before the last two in 1249. And this one, <laughs> this is pretty funny, I think. He says, dropping off body and mind is good practice. He starts off. <laughs> well, of course it is. But also dropping off body and mind for Dogen, Shinjin Datsuraku in Sino-Japanese, is a synonym for Zazen for Dogen. It's also a synonym for complete awakening, unsurpassed complete perfect awakening, uh, is dropping off body and mind. This does not mean getting rid of thinking, does not mean um, ascetic mutil, you know, uh, mutilation or of the body. <laughs> it's not lobotomy Zen, which you know was popular in early American Zen. If you just stop thinking that that's then that's awakening. That's not the point. Uh, dropping off body and mind is good practice, he says. Make a vigorous effort to pierce your nostrils. I'll come back to that image. Karmic consciousness is endless with nothing fundamental to rely on, including not others, not self, not sentient beings, and not even causes and conditions. And then Dogen closes this with this uh, discourse saying, although this is so, eating breakfast comes first. <laughs> so, um, Yes, um, please take care of yourself. Eating breakfast comes first. And um, it's still morning here and a little later in the morning there in Atlanta. But uh, uh, I hope you, you all enjoyed your breakfast. Uh, so uh, he's ha he says, has this line, um, make a vigorous effort to pierce your nostrils. When I first, when we first translated this, uh, Shohaku and I, uh, I thought that meant 
being able to breathe fully, to inhale through your nose. You know, we sit with our mouth closed and uh, make a vigorous effort to pierce your nostrils. So I thought he was talking about uh, breathing. <laughs> and I sometimes say to uh, uh, my students uh, to enjoy your inhale and exhale as a uh, Zazen instruction. But uh, Shohaku corrected me or gave me another aspect of this. Uh, translating this with Shohaku was wonderful. Um, but he said that this piercing your nostrils is uh, like, uh, you know, what is now known as piercing. And uh, the point of it is to put a nose ring in it, to be led by the teacher. So this goes back to the ox herding pictures and the images of the ox as the student being led by the teacher. So uh, Dogen says, uh, make a vigorous effort to pierce your nostrils. So uh, in addition to breathing, it also means um, to allow yourself to be uh, led or taught by the teacher. It's not that the teacher had, is, has perfect knowledge or is a perfect being, but they have a little more experience and they can show you your awareness, your, you can discover yourself through your engagement with the teacher. So, uh, so okay, so that's, so uh, I'm, I shared these different teachings from the history of our Soto Zen tradition uh, to show a kind of through line going back to Shito and uh, Yaoshan and then two generations Dongshan, uh, who was considered the, the founder of Chinese Soto Zen or Cao Dong, pronounced in Chinese, and then Hongzhe and Dogen. And we could see it in, teach in Soto Zen teaching in modern context in the West as well. Uh, this um, not to attain, not to know. It's not that we, and, and you know, um, I don't know how much uh, Tayan Roshi emphasizes Kensho in some in some Zen schools that's emphasized. And that's okay. Um, there are these dramatic experiences of realization that happen, but that's not the point from the point of view of Soto Zen uh, meditation tradition. The point is then how do we share this with all beings? And Dogen makes this clear and Hongsha makes this clear and it's not about attaining something as Shuto says. So, uh, we do have, I think we have some time for discussion, and I'm really interested in your comments and questions, and I can go back and reread any of those that you would like, but um, I don't know how you do this, Taya and Roshi, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of questions. Well, I see a hand already from Joseph Weissman, so I'll start with you. John Hinman is our coordinator. John Hinman. Yeah, you should let John guide yeah okay john thank would you please uh questions from the from the zendo or from the online folks My, uh, i will mention if anyone online would like to post a question in the chat i'll be happy to share that with you and uh i'll help moderate uh online maybe hojo can help in the zendo joseph Thank you, John. Yes, Joseph. Hey, I, I guess I just broadly and very quickly, I just wanted to thank you for the what seemed like a really potent series of, you know, practice instructions. And I, I like that you spent a few minutes at the end kind of drawing out the these are some very beautiful and deep themes that, you know, you sort of, I don't know, have pulled have found across these different sequences. I, I, I would draw out, you know, just in the spirit of trying to vigorously respond, um, at least to, you know, I sort of, there in the, some of the earlier instructions, there was a, a lot of emphasis on kind of dissolving obstructions or understanding how there's really no obstructions, the sky doesn't obstruct the clouds. I, I guess just there was, a, I, I felt a, a very specific undercurrent about maybe like integration and kind of, I, I'd characterize it almost as a therapeutic angle. You know, it's like this idea of not attaining and not knowing does kind of resonate with what I don't know psychologists might talk about like letting go of your neurotic need to seem like you know you know everything or something and um 
So I don't know. I, I mean, it, it struck me that Zen, I guess I was really thinking about the, the two arrow points that are like drawn together as like one of the kind of central problems. It's like, how do they, do, how do you, you know, go from abstraction to integration to some kind of awakening? And like, um, I think, you know, if one of the arrows is like this psychological problem of, you know, it, it's anyway, it's interesting to me, like you sort of emphasize this thing about where it was, you know, I will be and and that like we make this shift from kind of object to subject that is, you know, something like at least sounds like a psychological formulation and not to overemphasize again, like the therapeutic dimension. Um, but I, I guess it was that it was like between psychology and philosophy as like I would see as the two, you know, these two kind of arrowheads pushing together, whereas philosophy is saying, examine your life, the unexamined life isn't worth living, like carefully analyze and take an inventory of things. Um, in psychology, the, the problem space is different. We're shifting to where, you know, to how, how do I move towards, you know, engage subjective action in the world and recognizing the questioning the value of life does make you sick at some point. I don't know, just kind of think maybe Zen is kind of the balance between those two things. But. Uh, thank you so much for bringing up this point. It's very important. So yes, I'm I, I, in the selections from the Soto tradition that I that I offered. Uh, yeah, it's emphasizing uh, not to attain, not to know, just to see the bright sky and so forth. But practically speaking, for us, and I would say for all <laughs> the generations before, uh, maybe the most difficult part of Zazen is not getting your legs into some funny position, but actually when you sit, just being present with the stream of thoughts and feelings and the spaces of not thinking in between that, um, there's, uh, we have to learn intimacy with ourselves. All our ancient twisted karma, which you, we chanted earlier. Uh, so uh, yeah, we all have uh, conditioning from uh, from our life before this, from family and friends, from parents, from uh, our culture, certainly. We all have ways in which we get caught up in degrading situations, as Hong Shu says. And Zazen gives us a chance to look at that. As Dogen says, to study the self is, to study the way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. Uh, to forget the self is to be awakened by all things. But I think Zen students sometimes have this, you know, want the spiritual bypass of forgetting the self before they actually study the self. So we have to be, so part of what Zazen provides us, and this refers to, you know, goes back to your question, Joseph, is that there is, you know, we all have ways in which we're obstructed by causes and conditions and by our conditioned life and by our limitations as human beings and so forth. So uh, to become intimate, to become uh, familiar with all of these hangups or whatever is to open up to the, the, the bright sky. And that's kind of endless. I mean, you know, we um, sometimes can get rid of addictions and habits and, but, you know, a lot of them just keep going, but how do we not be caught by them? That's the point. Whatever our, our patterns of grasping or aversion, how do we not react to them and act based on them, but instead have a, bro a, a, a broader field from which to respond as we choose? So thank you for bringing that up, Joseph. It's a very important point. Uh, Yoji here. Unless you have something further on that, Joseph. Go ahead, you have one. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, at the very beginning, you were saying that not thinking is beyond thinking. And um, I just, maybe you kind of just answer that. You, you're talking about being fully present with your thoughts and emotions. But could you kind of, in some Zen, um, beyond thinking, could you expound upon that just a little bit? And maybe you already have, but just make a little concrete thank you yes so um 
again, Hishirio, uh, whether you whether you prefer non-thinking or beyond thinking, as Shohaku says, um, it, it's um, it's not to try and get rid of your thinking. And I think there, I, I believe there uh, is one tendency in, uh, I don't know if it's just Zen or spiritual practices in general to try and, you know, <laughs> try and not have, not have any thoughts. But as Uchiyama Roshi, who was Shohaku's teacher said, as you sit, of course, your stomach continues to secrete digestive juices. Your brain continues similarly to secrete thoughts. So getting rid of thoughts is not the goal, but not being caught by thoughts uh, to allow the, the clouds to drift by, uh, to be present with thoughts. Um, you know, th so there are particular practices and koan practice emphasizes this of, tr of, of actually focusing on, on thoughts and, and trying to break through with thoughts and, um, so Genjo, one could talk about Genjo Koan in this light, but the main point of beyond thinking is not to be caught by your thinking. It's not to deny your thinking either. It's a kind of awareness, as Tayan Roshi said, before thinking, beyond thinking, around thinking, <laughs> upside down of thinking, whatever, uh, to, to, and also including just not thinking, of course, as we sit for a period of zazen, there are spaces where our mind is not secreting thoughts. <laughs> so all of that's included. It's a kind of awareness, I would say, a kind of deep physical uh, awareness. So I guess it's kind of like uh, well, Yijiyama and his teaching is basically not stringing the thoughts together. So basically, you still have thoughts, but to me, thinking kind of is a dialogue, putting those thoughts together. And so basically, you know, a, a flower were to pop up, you start saying, oh, a red flower, oh, a rose. And so you continue that thinking, putting one thought together after another. And, and so basically, not thinking or going beyond it would be not putting those together. It would just be the flower and it would just move on. Well, maybe that, that might be one way that it works, but it's also just you know, when we see the stream of thoughts, stream of consciousness, and yes, you're right, there are these connections between thoughts, and we can, you know, hear red flower and then say, think rose, you know, but not to be caught by it, not to try and, uh, uh, so if you, if you, if, so part of how thinking works, as you're saying, is that there's this stream, this connection, this train of thought, and when you see that you're, when you feel, when you smell that you are caught up in a stream of thought, that's okay. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But then just let it go. Letting go is, Dogen says non thinking is, or beyond thinking is the essential art of zazen. I would add, letting go is the essential art of zazen. Uh, not being caught by our, caught our, habits of thinking. I don't know if that helps. Thank you. Thank you for your teaching. Ungan, did you have a question? Ungan? Thank you so much for being with us, Tagan. Uh, I had a question, but I think it's already been answered during the discussion. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you for listening. Let's do another online. I think there are more of you than there are of us. I notice uh, Katsuru has his hand up. Yes, good morning, everybody. And um, thank you, Tygen, for your, for your teaching today. Could you say a little bit more about, as you were talking about Dogen, you mentioned a, a line about one punch, kind of, could you could you talk about that in relationship to what it was the zazen I think it was referring to before that? Thank you. Yes, uh, you're welcome. There are a number of 
uh, these Dharma Hall discourses in Dogen's extensive record, which are very funny, in which he acts out various um, a, a, approaches. Sometimes, and, and some of this goes back to China, um, but sometimes he'll throw down his staff um, or sometimes he'll just st step down from the seat, you know, as part of the Dharma Hall discourse. So it's a kind of, so all of these are kind of performance pieces. Uh, this is um, uh, performance art. Uh, so Dogen is very much involved in, you know, and Dharma is performance, you know, and Zazen is performance, I would say. We, in Zazen, we are sitting, performing Buddha in our body mind. So our upright sitting, sitting silently, thinking or not thinking or beyond thinking, whatever, is to sit like Buddha, to be present like Buddha. So we're performing Buddha. And Buddha is not something that exists somewhere else. Buddha is what's happening on each of our seats. Or, you know, when we're doing kinhin on each in each of our walking steps. <laughs> so Dogen is performing, and sometimes he does these funny things. So in the one that you asked about, um, he says, um, uh, he asks already such, how can we penetrate it? How do we, you know, uh, expand and, and uh, open up this awareness that is already here? Um, so uh, I could talk about Dharmakaya and uh, the Avatamsaka Sutra here, if anyone's interested, but that are ba that basically the Buddha is, is already present. How do we express it? How do we observe it? How do we enjoy it? How do we play with it in our zazen and in our expression? That's what Dogen is talking about. So he says, snatching Gotama's hands and legs, one punch knocks over empty space. <laughs> so this is a, a kind of rhetoric that, you know, is uh, echoes are developed from uh, Chinese uh, uh, rhetoric, like in the Blue Cliff Record, where they talk in that kind of way. And you don't have to go there, but it's, it's anyway, uh, he also, uh, he, he talks about this in other places. There's another funny one where he, he uh, knocks knocks over the em empty sky and 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 it rains uh, rice cakes. <laughs> anyway, uh, Dogen's extensive record is very entertaining as well as everything else. Tying in one question on that one is that the first word smashing Buddha's hands smashing. No, uh, I, uh, sorry, snatching, snatching. Yes. Snatching, okay. Snatching yeah. Buddha's hands and legs. Okay, good. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it. Okay. Anything? We have one. We call a fish. Yeah. Um, about the non thinking, um, um, or beyond thinking. I, I think I follow the favor of of beyond thinking, because I know in my own thinking processes, there are times when I am not thinking as we tend to do in a line at all. There is there is a moment in meditation or in uh, just, I have a practice when I'm creating, just sitting there and, and sort of letting the water get hot in the tea kettle, <laughs> where, um, Full impressions of information will come to me. There is no thought process. All of a sudden, I know exactly what I'm supposed to do, and it's things I haven't done before. And uh, so the idea of beyond thinking, I understand well. I'm comfortable with it. Uh, that's just the, but that's the way I experience it. Thank you. Thank you. And so, um... I'll go back even further than Shito. His teacher's teacher was the sixth ancestor, Huineng, um, 
Icon Eno Daiosho. Uh, and um, in the platform sutra attributed to the uh, sixth ancestor, Wainang, uh, my favorite part of that is a little chapter on the oneness of jhana and prajna, or you could say samadhi and prajna. And this relates very much to what you were just saying, because what that uh, teaching says is that when in samadhi, insights, prajna insights come up naturally. They're one, they're not separate. So uh, the, what you describe as a kind of whole awareness that's not necessarily a product of linear rational thinking, that that is part of what uh, our samadhi offers us, our zazen offers us, that we suddenly, and especially if you have some problem, you know, that you're, that's been on your mind, you know, today or the last week or the last year or this lifetime, uh, in samadhi, it's possible, it happens that insights arise. And they usually, you know, are, are the way you just described it. Uh, so yeah, that's another um, another aspect of beyond thinking or non-thinking. That when when we settle into this performance of Buddha sitting upright, uh, we have these these full-bodied insights. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, you know, there, there was this question that came up and I'm tempted to, you know, about, uh, you know, going back to Shito, the, the, his student asking him, what is the essential meaning of Buddha Dharma? And there's another passage in uh, Koroku and Dogen's extensive record, which I'm tempted to disclose to you. And... Um, I'm sorry if this causes trouble, but one of uh, Dogen's closest students in the in his the early half of his career in in Kyoto was a nun named Ryonen, and in Volume Eight of the ten volumes in Ehikoroku, uh, where he's giving these more ex extensive Dharma words, three of them are addressed to her. And he says, do you want to know the essential meaning of Buddha Dharma? Which is the same question that the monk asked Shito. And then he says, the essential meaning of Buddha Dharma is to not remember a single word or phrase from the teachings or from the sutras or from the koans or from anything I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry, I've just given you a big problem because you might remember this, these words. Anyway, I'll just, I'm just throwing that in there. So I think there's um, a- listen to me, don't listen to me. <laughs> we have a hand up from more, more guy, more guy. More gain, more gain. Namaste. Um, could you, uh, thank you. For, for your teaching, but could you please repeat where that was from? I'd like to revisit that at some point. At oh, that, <laughs> that particular uh, thing with Rionen? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes I mean, I can, for those who want, I can do pages and so forth, but uh, it's from a, Dogen's extensive record that I translated with um, Shahaku Okamura. Well, I could say something about that process too. Um, let me see if I can find page. Um, probably can. Um, anyway, it's in volume eight. Okay. And um, hold on. Let me see if I can find it. I can give you the page number. Um, to be in the Atlanta metro area, we have a copy here. You can come and read. <laughs> Unfortunately, that won't be happening anytime soon, but thank you so much, Gusho. Um, anyway, it's in, it, it's um, page 520 something. Anyway, it's in there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you don't mind me asking, it seems you have a linguistic 
uh, connections. And I am a fan of linguistics myself. For the sutras, if one wants to study them in the original, uh, the original, going back sort of, I know so it's all interconnected, but would you have a recommendation, Japanese, Chinese, or specific reference that would have the sutras in English and the other? And then maybe- yeah. would... So this, there are Chinese translations of the sutras. Um, Oh gosh, uh, you know, I'd have to say for, I could give recommendations for particular sutras. So uh, if you want to ask particular questions, any of you, you can email me at info at ancientdragon.org and I'll respond. Um, but um, yeah, um, these sutras, the Mahayana sutras, which are has been my fo the focus of my study and the basis for Dogen, although he, you know, also respects the earlier um arhat sutras but suttas but uh sanskrit is their original language but most of them many of them have been lost in sanskrit so what we have are the chinese translations so um there are various um um and, uh volumes that have both english and the chinese and, and Jap Japanese is based on Chinese. It includes Chinese characters, but also Japanese syllabary. I'm not very good at languages, I should say. Um, but, okay. It sounds like if I start with the Chinese, I, I have some Sanskrit and I, I like to dabble in languages. So if I start with the Chinese, then that gives a good base foundation and then you can explore from there. Would that be accurate? That's right. And, and again, e email me at info at ancient dragon, uh, ancient dragon, one word org and I can respond to particular questions. But since you're talking about language, I want to say something about the process uh, that I was uh, involved with with Shohaku Okamura, uh, who, um, when we were translating, I, I translated two books with him in in Japan when I was pra practicing with him, translating with him uh, Dogen's Pure Standards for the Zen Community, a Shingi, and the Wholehearted Way, which is the wonderful uh, essay in Shobo Genzo Bendo Wa and Uchiyama Roshi's comments. But Dogen's extensive record we did in, in San Francisco when he moved to San Francisco. And, um, you know, Shobo Genzo is more difficult, I would say, than, than a Hikoroku generally, because Dogen is very poetic and puts together lots of different things. And Dogen is citing you know, many orig original texts and koans and um, uh, and and his, lang his language is uh, not something that modern Japanese people can read in the, in the way he it was written down. It's kind of like reading Chaucer in English, uh, Chaucer in English or Beowulf even. But anyway, um, as we were going through Dogen's extensive record, we would come to some Dharma Hall discourses. So I would be looking at the Chinese characters, which I could work with some, and Shohaku would be reading it in the Japanese, and he would say what he thought was the meaning of a particular passage. But sometimes, this happened, you know, more than a few times, he would look at it and say, I don't understand. I don't know what this is saying. And I would try and suggest possible meanings and they would say no it can't mean that because of this and so forth and we sometimes would spend hours literally numbers of hours on one particular dharma hall discourse but then when we came back to the literal meaning suddenly it would be clear of course sometimes there are, in Ch chinese characters have lots of overtones and lots of various meanings so you know sometimes we had to put in the footnotes alternative possible readings. But anyway, it was this happened a number of times where the literal meaning of what Dogen was saying would suddenly become clear. So <laughs> translating is a um, <laughs> challenging art. Anyway, I don't know if that's relevant to what you were asking. It's lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm an actor by trade. So to me, it's akin to studying Shakespeare. Um, there's a lot of 
going into it, delving into it, discussion, and then oftentimes you go round about, <laughs> and then it seems that it was right there in front of you the whole time. So yep. I. So. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question, but Hojo, do you have someone in the room that has a question as well? Everybody is fully enlightened now. They have no questions. <laughs> I have some hey. comments toward the end. Hey, yeah. it, it worked, Tygen. You did a good job. Thank Tygen, you. you. You do have a way of confusing me. You mentioned earlier uh, a quote or a teaching that you knew would be confusing. Oh, <laughs> which was that? On the one hand, you occasionally allude to this seeking process, and I'm just looking at some of my notes, this striving, this realizing, this attaining. And once we find that teacher who is going to help us with all of that, he basically says, let go, be satisfied, be not knowing. <laughs> now, well, but Dogen regularly, often throughout Shobogenzo, for example, says, do you fully, and also in, in, in Dogen's extensive record, he says, do you fully understand this? Please study this thoroughly. He doesn't mean necessarily, so, you know, study is a funny word because we're all trained as, you know, in uh, Western educational systems to try and analyze and parse and, you know, um, when Dogen says, please study this, he means with your whole body. So, but he doesn't, he doesn't say, oh, now you have it. Um, well, actually, Dongshan says, now you have it, preserve it well. But what is that meaning? What is in the beginning of Hokyo Zamai, Dongshan says that. But what it means is that we have to um, really look into what is this teaching? What is being said? How does it relate to this body mind on your seat? Uh, so, uh, and and there's, that's an endless process. So some of these, some of these teachings, and and stories and so forth, and passages from Dogen that I've been referring to. I mean, I've been studying for decades and decades, and um, uh, and it and depending on where you're at. <laughs> new meanings appear. So uh, this process of ever expanding, ever deepening awareness uh, is part of the practice. I don't know if that responds to your question. One quick follow-up. Hygen, is my energy best served by looking inward, inward study? inward meditation, zazen, are better served outward looking at the teacher, the teaching, the dharma. Yes. <laughs> both are essential. Uh, so, uh, both Hong, Hongzhi and Dogen talk about responding. How do we express and very much Dogen is emphasizes expressing, maybe even more than Hongzhi does, expressing this in our everyday activity. So yes. Thank you for your teaching. Zinku has a hand up. Hi, Zinku. <laughs> good morning, Tigan. So good to see you. Good to see you Terrific too. Good to see you this morning. I thank you so much for your teaching. Uh, there's so many things to, to cover here, I, but I, I want to go back to Dong Chang's poem, if we can. And, uh, you know, it now is me, I now am not it line. And yes. you said you had more to say about that. You know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I, I have a sense of myself, this is me. But when I understand more broadly, I realize that I am not uh, the oneness, you know, I, I am maybe different from the oneness of all things. This is an image that I pick up from this, but I'd be really interested in your commentary. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How many <laughs> hours do we have? Um, <laughs> uh, just give us some samplings. <laughs> well, just, you know, again, I talk about that a lot. Yes. 
this book and I talk about the five degrees or five ranks, which is an yes. expression of that. And Jewel Mer Samadhi, I don't know if you chant that, yes. but um, yeah, so our, no, Dogen, Dogen also says that uh, to be in delusion throughout delusion, to be in awakening throughout awakening. Now, our practice is not to get rid of delusion, but to recognize when delusion is here, when awakening is here, we're always in delusion. But okay, uh, it now is me. I now am not it. The I now am not it is that we do have our own you know, personal history and ideas about things and so forth. And our usual deluded way of being is to project that onto the world. So to see things, to see our experience, to see life, to see the world around us in terms of our preconceptions. And that's not it. But, you know, that's what we, that's the reality of our life as, as you know, limited human beings. Um, but so I am not it, but it now is me. So I would um, see this now in terms of the Dharmakaya that the whole the whole universe is, you know, Stokin cites one of the teachers, the whole universe is one bright pearl. The whole universe is Buddha's awakening. So when we say Dharma Dhatu, the realm of things, that also means the realm, the realm of phenomena as informed by reality and teaching and Dharma. So that's why Buddha is right there on, on your seat for everyone already but we need to realize it we need to uncover it we need to express it and share it so yes going back to the previous question that means looking within and it also means looking at the world around us and and listening to teaching and and the teacher and so forth so um yeah again dogen says in genjo koan uh to carry yourself forward and experience the myriad things that's, I am not it. That's what we, that's our usual way of doing things, projecting ourselves onto everything. The, uh, that myriad things come forth and realize themselves, which of course includes all of us. That's awakening. So uh, it now is me. Wonderful. Great. Thank you, Tiger. Thank Good to you see you. I'm sorry, Teshin has been waiting patiently uh, with his hand up. One of the translations I've heard used is to examine thoroughly in practice, which gives a little bit different flavor than the study. But I wanted to ask, are you familiar with a book called The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World by Ian McGilchrist? I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds fascinating. The, the reason I mention it is, um, as I'm listening, it seems like there is so much overlap between Zen practice and left brain, right brain theory, as if we're sitting in Zazen examining the linear um, carrying on of the left brain and in an attempt to allow ourselves to go still enough that the bright, right brain can function in a little more holistic manner anyway it's it's a it's a bit thick reading but it's i highly recommend it to anybody that's interested in the overlap between zen practice and brain theory can you please say that again because i don't know it uh the title is the master and his emissary And the author is Ian, which is spelled I-A-I-N, Mick Gilchrist. Mick, M-C, rather than M-A-C. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm way behind on my reading, but uh, managing, as, as Tayun is, managing uh, Sangha is <laughs> all consuming. So I... Uh, um, I'm in the middle of um, passing along the guiding teacher position to a, a student 
of mine, or uh, actually uh, another transmitted teacher in our sangha. But um, I'm hoping that when that process is finished, I'll have more time to read. <laughs> but I'll I'll try and remember this one. Sounds good. And yes, you know, the point is not to get rid of left brain, rational, linear thinking at all. That's not, that can be very useful in terms of uh, supporting Bodhisattva way and, and the teaching and, and relieving suffering, but also to be, you know, so it's both, it's not one or the other, and also realizing right brain, intuitive, somatic awareness. So thank the, you. The author tends to speak to that same point and how if it gets too left brain as examples of the effect upon society as a whole and that the idea isn't to get rid of the left brain but it seems like society is more balanced and healthy when right brain and left brain are functioning together yes the integration is the point in our practice not uh not realizing some you know super awareness or becoming some super being, but actually integrating um, the ultimate and the phenomenal, to put it that way. Oh, Joe, you had mentioned you wanted to make a few comments at the end. If everybody else is uh, finished, yeah, I have just a couple things. Does anybody online have a final short question? Robert's got one here. Uh, Tiny, just just one real quick question. Uh, if what book do you have, or what book have you written that you would want any student to read? If there's one book that you wanted all the students to read, which one? And I know it's based on the person, but if I came to you and said, "What book should I read that you've written that would help me in my practice?" Which one would you recommend? Oh my gosh, they're all wonderful. <laughs> but uh, I, so I can I have to pick two uh, in terms of the continuity of Soto Zen teaching, Cultivating the Empty Field, which is my first book. And it's the one that most people mention to me. It's this is the teaching of Hongzhi. But then also follow that up. Maybe start off with just this is it, uh, Dongshan and the practice of suchness which responds to the last question very much. So those, I can, I have to pick two. Thank you so very much. Hi, and Roshi, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, and then I would follow with uh, Dogen's extensive record, which I send you a Shohaku a congratulatory note when I finally finished it. <laughs> it was my, bed, my bedside reading for about a year or over a year. I remember uh, just a personal thing, Ty, again, I think you and I first met in person in 2000 when you came to the Emory Conference on Dogen. Yes. And we, at that time, we were, we were positing that scholars and uh, practitioners were different and their approaches were different and sometimes at odds with each other. And we had people speaking from both sides of the, that coin. and. You and Shohaku Okamura, two standout examples of hybrids, you know, people who are able to bridge that gap and, and be both scholars and, uh, and translators and practitioners. And uh, Red Pine is another one who's come and visit us from time to time. And he made a comment similar to yours. He said, I dance with the language, <laughs> is the way he explained the process of translating. But uh, I, had a, I had a question for you. Uh, my dharma named Taihun made great cloud, and it's related to, I think, the poem, the blue sky and the white cloud, and Matsuoka Roshi explained it meant no barriers anywhere, like a cloud flying high in the sky. Yep. Of course, every time yes. I turn around, I run into another barrier, right? And so the, the meaning of my name is always up in my face every day. So I was just wondering uh, what Tai Gen means. Is that the Gen of Shobo Genso, the eye? No, um, it's the gen. Uh, it's not the same gen as do gen. Um, it's the gen of um, a, a, a spring in the mountain, the, uh, the source of a spring in the okay. mountain. So gen means source and do gen too, but the, tai gen, the gen in tai gen, so it's ultimate source, 
is, uh, is is a source of a story of an atom. So that's the same source in the first line when you trace the source of the way. Source. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, in uh, the uh, Dongchang quote, I had this one other thing where you were saying it's I'm it or it's not I'm not it. It's me. It is is I or it is it is it is me and so forth. In uh, Hokazamai, the Title chap stands in there. He says, uh, "Although it's not constructed, it is not beyond words. Right. Like facing a precious mirror, Hokio is on my precious mirror. Form and reflection behold each other. That's one of my favorites. And then he follows that by saying, "You are not it, but in truth, it is you." And I wonder, he just said this two different times. Yeah, it, he writing. says it. I, I can, it, It's actually much more complicated. <laughs> Sorry, but. Um, the um so yeah the, the, he uses different pronouns you are not okay. it actually is you in the hokyo zamai um and then usually it's translated i am not it it actually is me in in uh the story about dongshan but um if you have time i could complicate it further which is to, to say that the pronouns um could refer in various ways. So, uh, so when Yunyan said, "Just this is it," um, he it could also be read because Chinese has various meanings in the same character. It it could be read as just this person, right? Right. It might be Yunyan or Dongshan. So. Um, uh, so sometimes I go into this in in my book on Dongshan, but uh, and uh, it could be also read as I. Every, uh, let me look. Let me go back to the actual verse from after he looked in the in this reflection of the stream. It could be read, just don't seek from others. You'll be far strange from self. I now go on alone. Everywhere I meet him, everywhere I meet the teacher. That's his reflection in the. Yeah, in the, he now is me. I now am not him, or yeah. she now is me. I now am not her, um, referring to the teacher. So there's also it has that other meaning, which I uh, didn't go into in the presentation, but that's I, I talk about that in the book that these pronouns in Chinese have, have can be read in various ways, and I I would say they are all valid. So this is the thing about translation, uh, to go back to Morgan's question, that, you know, in translation, there are many translations of Dogen. The first translation I heard from from Reverend Nakajima was pretty terrible, actually. It was the only translation available then, and I, and I don't, I would not recommend it, but there are numbers of translations of the same koan or of Dogen that sound different, and they're all that, they could, the, the good translations can all be valid, even though they seem like they're different. And that's because the Chinese characters have these this various meanings. But I would say that the point of that is each one of us, when you see these translations, to see two good translations of Dogen gives you a, a, a better idea of the original of what Dogen was saying. And uh, you were talking about dancing. I would also say, one has to play with these texts and uh, see it for oneself. So what is it that each one of us brings to that text is the point. And so, yeah. If that brings up two um, pedagogical methods we use here, I emphasize memorization. I try to get everybody to memorize because even though you don't understand what the words, the somehow you assimilate it, by memorizing, and the other is comparative translation. We we put together grids on uh, Dogen's translation, different translators, so you can read between the lines, read the clause, and uh, that seems to be very helpful for most people. I did want to say one more thing but, about but very good. I appreciate that a lot. Yes, go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, multiple translations. Uh, we sometimes I will read one aloud while everybody else is reading one with their eyes, a different one, and you can begin to see what it's about. Yes. Then uh, 
the the idea of the psychology of this uh, that Joseph brought up in the beginning, the psychology versus the philosophy, et cetera. And I would put in there a third third angle, the physical, the physical reality in the context of those. One way I think is e easy to talk about and simple to think about is that what we go through in Zazen is a kind of regression. Matsuoka Roshi used to call it recovering your original mind or rediscovering, uncovering. So uh, I think we can think of it as uh, we abandon our reliance on thinking. We sit without relying on thinking. And so we approach more and more the kind of original mind that we had when we were two or three years old. And we didn't have much language. We didn't have many ideas. So you, you didn't have much to think about. And uh, so if you think of it that way, it's like subtracting rather than adding as you go. And you finally strip it, strip it down to something more primordial. And that would be your original mind, but with the full awareness of a mature adult now. Yes, good. I I, I like all that. Yes. Freud dismissed it as uh, the oceanic awareness of the infant in the crib. He dismissed meditation as just sort of returning you to that primordial state. But I think there's something to that that he was missing. Well, I would add to what you said that... Um... It's the integration of all the above. You know, yep. we have our so-called adult <laughs> kind of uh, uh, educated minds and right. also this basic primordial beyond thinking. So, yeah, all of it. And the point is to include it all. You know, it's not, not to take sides, but just to um, be to enjoy the whole process. Yeah. I've always thought of Zen as inclusive rather than exclusive, both socially and personally, and so on, yes. intellectually. And by the way, I'm recommending the books. I don't have the problem you have. I only have two, so I would recommend only one of two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, You're, I've, in Chicago. You're yeah. the Northern uh, Midwest School. We're the Southern Eastern, Southeastern School. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Wonderful to hear from you. And we owe you a debt of gratitude as a translator. All the translators, we owe a debt of gratitude. Because what would we, what would we do with the Chinese text? <laughs> Me either. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I think please that was please able to... consider us your, your sister Sangha and please plan to return many, many times in the future. Many happy, happy returns. Too. Thank you. Let me know again when you when I should come. Sure. Go back over to John. Do, John, do you want to do the uh, closing verse? We can do it from here. Yes, I'm going to do it muted because I don't want the feedback that I get uh, when you hear me. Okay, we do the four vows, and uh, we kind of like the cacophony that occurs. If you stay off mute, that's fine with us. We do the four vows three times. Maybe slightly different translation. I'm having a little bit of sound quality. Would someone else lead that, please? Beings are numberless. I allow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it. Beings are not Delusions are inexhaustible. How to end them? are boundless. How to enter them? The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it, beings are numberless. I vow to free them, delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them, dumb gates are boundless. I vow to enter them, the good way is unsurpassable. I vow to realize it. Thank you for your patience and listening.
Don't give up. Keep sitting. Thank you.